Okay, so let's talk a little bit about Austro-Libertarianism, Austrian economics and Libertarianism. Uh, Austrian economics is not the, uh, the economics of Austria, nor is <laughs> Chicago economics the economics of Chicago, nor is Lausanne economics the economics of Lausanne. Rather, these schools of thought are named because the people who were most influential in creating them and establishing them just happen to come from these cities or places. So let's get that possible fallacy out of the way. Now, Austrianism is a theory of economics. Libertarianism is a theory of moral philosophy, I suppose you could say. Austrianism is a positive science. Libertarianism is a normative science. Positive means what causes what, how do we explain and understand economic reality. <coughs> Um, if you do this to the money supply, what is likely to happen, things like that. In other words, it's totally value-free, as is chemistry. Chemistry can be used for good or ill, but it's value-free. It could ask, well, if you want to make water, you put H2O together and you get water. Or it could say, what's the best way to obliterate cities? Both are positive statements, even though some have normative implications, but the... Uh, the enterprise is a positive or scientific one, and Austrianism is that. It is, along with other economic and other social sciences and physical sciences, an attempt to understand and explain reality, not to put any value judgments on it. Whereas libertarianism, in very sharp contradistinction, is a value-laden subject. It doesn't ask what causes what or what's the best explanation of this phenomenon, but rather it, it asks what is the good what is the virtuous? What is the, um, the moral? Or what should the law be? So never the twain shall meet. They're in two different universes of discourse. It's as if you people on this side of the aisle are Austrian economists. You people are libertarians. And you never the twain shall meet. You have to keep that aisle sacrosanct because they're very different enterprises. And a lot of students initially don't see this clearly, so I'm spending a lot of time making that distinction. One of the reasons for the confusion is that virtually ever, every Austrian economist is a libertarian. <laughs> and here I just got finished saying that never the twain shall meet and they're very different. Well, how is it that we, as social scientists, can understand why it is that virtually every Austrian, not all Austrians, but virtually everyone, is a, a libertarian? Richard is a, an expert in uh, the history of uh, economic thought, and he tells me that there were several obscure Austrian economists who were Nazis. Well, Nazis aren't libertarians, <laughs> and yet they were Austrian economic, economists. So there, is, there are counterexamples. But nowadays, I don't think there are any Nazi Austrians. There might be, for all I know, but I don't know of any. So we have to try to explain why it is that virtually every Austrian is also a libertarian. And I suppose what I should do is explain a little bit of each of them to, well, I already did. One is value, one is... Um, is non-value. There are two reasons why it is, as far as I can think of, and I'd be happy to have input from the audience and maybe we can list some other reasons, but one reason is just an accident. It just so happens that Mises and Rothbard, people very, very heavily... <laughs> I was going to say thank you, but then I realized I'm not either Mises or Rothbard. <laughs> Plus, I paid him $10 for that, and he could have he done a better job. But, you know, just a little pathetic clap. I, I, give me that 10 bucks back. Uh, both Mises and Rothbard were uh, very rabid libertarians, if I can, or extreme libertarians, or uh, non-moderate ones. Let me tell you a little bit of a story. Uh, there was this thing called the Mont Pelerin Society, which was formed in the early days, and... Uh, they were having a discussion of, oh, how best to have welfare, take money from the rich and give it to the poor. And there were people like Friedman and Stigler and Hayek and Popper and Jukes and Leone. Maybe not those people in the room, but I just got the list of who the formers of the Mont Pelerin Society were. And Mises were there, and he picked himself up and in a huff, and he walked out and said, you're all a bunch of socialists. Yeah. And it was true. <laughs> and if anything, Rothbard is much more of an extreme libertarian than Mises was, but Mises compared to Friedman or Stigler or those guys was way more libertarian. So I think that part of the reason for this 
bias of Austrian economists toward libertarianism is because of the historical accident that several of the leading Austrians happen to be very, very strong libertarians. There's other reasons. Uh, one of the other reasons is that there's something about Austrianism, and when I get into it, you'll see, that biases you or pushes you in the direction of libertarianism. There are certain technical matters that need not push you in that way, but sort of do. And I'll try to explain that. Uh, to give you an indication of just how non-libertarian the leading non-Austrian free enterprise economist is, who I take to be Milton Friedman, I think that's a non-controversial statement. Here's a list of Milton Friedman's deviations from the one true faith of liberty. Uh, to just give you a short definition of libertarianism, libertarianism is a political philosophy based on normative considerations where there are two axioms. One is the non-aggression axiom. The non-aggression axiom says, keep your mitts to yourself. Keep your hands in your pockets. Don't put them around the throat of other people or their property. Don't grab their property. And the second axiom of libertarianism is private property rights. Because uh, suppose I see uh, Richard grabbing, what's your name here? Joseph. Joseph. Suppose I see Richard grabbing Joseph's beautiful red tie and running away with it. And Joe is crying because he just lost his tie. Is, is Richard an invader? Is Richard an aggressor? Is Richard a violator of the non-aggression axiom? Well, not so fast because you have to know whose tie it is. If it's Joe's legitimate tie, then Richard is indeed a, an invader and a violator of libertarianism. But suppose Joe stole that tie from Richard yesterday, and Richard is now repossessing it from Joe, who does, is the improper owner of it. Well then, this is not a violation of rights. So in other words, you just can't say when A punches B that A is necessarily the aggressor. It depends upon who owns the chin and who owns the tie and what the uh, context is. So you need a theory of property rights also. And the libertarian theory of property rights is pretty much based on homesteading. You own yourself, you own that part of nature that you mix your labor with. If I domesticate a cow and you uh, build some corn, grow some corn, I own the cow, you own the corn. Another legitimate title of property would be based on any legitimate title transfer, says Robert Nozick. For example, trade or gifts or gambling or what have you. So if I have the milk and you have the corn and we trade, even though I didn't create the corn and you didn't create the milk, still we are now the legitimate owners of the stuff we didn't produce because you can trace it back to either homesteading or voluntary trade. So that's what libertarianism is. And in my view, Rothbard was 100% libertarian. Well, nobody's 100%, even me, but 99.9. .9, and uh, Mises was 99.0. Very close. Friedman, um, I don't know, uh, give him a 75 or an 80 or an 85 or something like that. I mean, he's not all bad. He would hardly get the reputation of Mr. Free Enterprise if he were you know, a complete and utter total socialist. But on the other hand, and, and he sounded as a bell on minimum wage and free uh, trade and uh, rent control and a whole bunch of other things. But he um, promoted the withholding tax. Withholding tax is a problem because they sort of take it out of you like a vampire slowly. <laughs> Whereas if you had to pay it all on April 15th, there'd be blood on the streets when people realized how much they were paying. He later on apologized for that, which is to his credit. But you don't find a Friedman or a, a, a Rothbard or a Mises having to say that and then apologize for it. <laughs> he still favored, uh, before he died, the negative income tax. Namely, if you make below a certain amount of money, the taxes you pay are negative. Namely, the government gives you money. And guess where the government gets money from? Well, from other people against their will at the point of a gun. So that's hardly compatible with libertarianism. He's against gold. He has this pretty good uh, TV series and book, Free to Choose. But when we're, whenever we were free to choose, we always chose gold. And yet he calls us ad advocates of gold, gold bugs, which is a denigration. He favors the Fed and the 3% rule, but the Fed is not part of the free enterprise system. The central banking, coercive banking, isn't part of the market. He's a Rhodes socialist. I once called him that. He didn't appreciate that. We were in a debate. See, I favor privatizing of all roads, streets, and highways because I think 40,000 people a year die on them every year, and it's not due to 
uh, drunken driving or speeding. It's due to the fact that the managers of the roads are, can't manage their way out of a paper bag because they're the government. And when something bad happens, they don't automatically go broke. I'm from New Orleans. I don't really mind that FEMA and the Army Corps of Engineers screwed us up. What the heck? To screw up is human. We all make mistakes. What really bugs me is that they're still at the same lemonade stand after that. Whereas if a private company did something like that, you know they'd be bankrupt. And, we, and I expect better results from a system where if you make errors, you lose money. And if you do too much of that, you're out. Then from a system where no matter how badly you screw up, you're still, you're still in there. Other vi uh, violations of freedom of Milton Friedman are educational vouchers instead of private education, flexible exchange rates instead of gold, neighborhood, effect, neighborhood effects, externalities, so-called market failures. There ain't no market failures. There are only government failures. Public goods is another problem of his. And then he also favors monopoly and antitrust. I must tell you my monopoly and antitrust joke. You better laugh. <laughs> you see, when an economist tells a joke, you don't ask whether it's funny or not. You just laugh. It's sort of like when a bear plays the violin riding a unicycle. You don't ask if the bear is in tune. You, know, you just sort of say, wow, a bear, told, you know, a, bear, a bear rode a unicycle and played the violin. Wow. So you, you have to say, wow, an economist told a joke. I don't care if it's funny or not. It's amazing. <laughs> so anyway, it's a two-part uh, joke. Let me take off my coat. Economics is... Not heavy lifting, but it's a hot subject, so. <laughs> uh, it's a two-part joke. The first part is there were three Soviet prisoners in jail. And as prisoners do, they tell each other why they're in jail. And the first guy said, well, I came to work late, and the government accused me of cheating the state out of my labor services. The second guy said, I came to work early, and they accused me of brown nosing. <laughs> the third guy said, thanks for the laugh. <laughs> The third guy came and said, you know, I came to work every day exactly on time, and they accused me of owning a Western wristwatch. <laughs> I once told that joke to a bunch of economists and lawyers who were into antitrust. I had a college roommate uh, who used to specialize in money, and he told me there's no money in money. There's only money in antitrust, <laughs> because you get to testify in all sorts of weird cases. So the second part of the joke, I, I got a big laugh out of this audience on the first part of the joke. The second part was dead silence. They didn't like this one bit. And here the point is that there were three U.S. prisoners in jail uh, guilty of violating monopoly laws, antitrust laws. And the first guy said, well, I'm in jail because they accused me of um, charging too much, profiteering, gouging. Second guy said, well, uh, they accused me of charging too little, predatory price cutting, cutthroat competition. And the third guy said, I charge the same price as everyone else. It's hard to see how he did, given these other two guys, but <laughs> let that go. And they accused me of collusion and price, uh, uh, <laughs> price agreements. And so <laughs> what was the point of this joke? <laughs> Thank you. The second part is funny. <laughs> The point of this joke is that antitrust is dead from the neck up. It's, uh, it's a crazy law. I mean, if you can be guilty no matter what you do, uh, that's not a law. I mean, uh, the law against rape or murder are, are reasonable laws because you can either be guilty or innocent of them. But if there's a law that you must be guilty of, well, you know, that's, that's not a law. That's lunacy. Okay, let me talk a little bit about Austrianism. Austrianism is a praxeological science. It's a logical science. It's not an empirical science. We don't have physics envy like the mainstream economists do. See, what the mainstream economists do, they fashion economics on the vision of physics or chemistry. They have a hypothesis. They set up a hypothesis and um, say minimum wage law creates unemployment among unskilled workers. And then they go out and test it. And if the econometric analysis supports this contention that the minimum wage law creates unemployment for unskilled workers, they tentatively accept it. But they don't, they're not rigid, they're not cultish about this. This is what they call us, I'll get to that in a minute. They just accept it tentatively like good scientists. Because who knows, the next experiment might show that uh, it's wrong. Very, very scientific of them. Whereas for Austrians, we don't see it that way at all. We see it. Uh, akin to 2 plus 2 is 4. You don't test that. Or that triangles have 180 degrees. You don't test that. 
or the Pythagorean theorem that the uh, sum of the, what is it, squares of the sides equal the square of the hypotenuse. You don't test that. You don't go out and look for triangles to see if they have 180 degrees. If they don't have 180 degrees, they're not triangles. It's a very different way of looking at economic reality. We have axioms that are absolutely true and do not admit of testing. If the tests show that they're wrong, then there's something wrong with the test, not with the, not with the axiom. Now, Milton Friedman's argument against this, ah, oh, thank you. Milton Friedman's argument against this is, well, if two neoclassical economists disagree, they can perform an empirical test. Whereas if two Austrians disagree, they can only fight. Well, you see, we don't see Austrianism as a branch of physical sciences. We see it rather as a branch of geometry or logic, symbolic logic. Well, when is the last time you saw two uh, geometricians or logicians having a fist fight when they disagreed? No, you don't have to have a fist fight. You just go back over the premises and try to uh, uh, settle the thing in a rational way. As a result, these people call us cultists because we are not scientific. I don't see us as cultists. I see us as uh, an alien branch of economics, alien to what the mainstream is. And yes, I admit we're alien in the sense of different. We're a very much a minority position, but that doesn't mean that we're wrong. It just means we're following a different star and it's logical and, and Austrians disagree over things and we offer uh, indications of illogic or contradiction or what have you. It's a legitimate scientific enterprise, just like geometry or symbolic logic is. Let me give you an example. I did my PhD dissertation on the Gary Becker, who was a famous neoclassical economist. And what I was trying to show is that if you have rent control, it sort of screws up housing. It, uh, it, it retards investment in low rental units. People don't want to put their money in there. If, if the prices are controlled, they'll put their money somewhere else. So I was trying to show through, this is before I became an Austrian, I was trying to show that there was a correlation, uh, a statistically significant correlation between rent control on the one hand and all sorts of indices of lousy housing. Abandonment, uh, poor quality housing, that the Census Bureau keeps track of things like that. Holding constant weather and uh, wealth, because if an observation is very wealthy, even though they have rent control, the place might not be so bad. And most of the times I would get the right signs for my observations, and I would get good statistical significance, T values of 2.0 2 or more, or something like that, and everything was hunky-dory. Every once in a while, though, I'd get the wrong sign, namely the more rent control, the better the housing. And sometimes, God forbid, I got statistically significant results like that. Now, do you think Becker went around saying, oh, I've got this genius student block. He's going to overturn economics because he's showing that rent control leads to the exact opposite conclusions of what we think it leads to? No, he said, he didn't say this, but this is the way he meant it. He was too polite. He said, block, you moron. Go out and do it again until you get it right. <laughs> Namely, we know what the effects of rent control are to ruin housing. To, to keep investment away from housing, to take away incentives of landlords to repair housing. We know that. So we're not testing anything. What we are doing is illustrating. But we know what the right answer is. Just like we know that the Pythagorean theorem is right, and if the triangle we've got is wrong, it's the fault of the triangle. You've got to get a, build a better triangle or a better mousetrap or something like that. So it's a fallacy to say that Austrians are against empirical research or statistics or econometrics or any of that stuff. Rather, it's the interpretation we place on it. What we think we're doing is illustrating axiomatic truths in economics. What they think they're doing is testing it. Well, if they really thought that, why didn't they accept my views? Cardin Kruger recently came out with this thing showing that minimum wage law is great, you know, it creates, um, uh, it creates employment, whereas we all know that the minimum wage law creates unemployment for unskilled workers. So Cardin Kruger from Princeton, uh, somewhere, you know, top economists, or at least in their view. <laughs> now you'd think that the 
the Chicagoans, who were sort of free enterprise, the Milton Friedman and Gary Becker types, you'd think they'd say, well, you know, isn't this interesting? Isn't this an interesting new development that maybe the minimum wage law uh, doesn't create unemployment among unskilled workers? No, they didn't say that at all. They said, we're going to get these guys. Their research is crappy. They, they didn't, um, uh, it wasn't replicatable. Namely, when you go back and add, do the same surveys, you don't get people. They uh, forgot this, they forgot that. They had real blood in their eye. Namely, they were good economists. Namely, they were Austrian economists. Even though they didn't know it and, and would, you know, fight against uh, being labeled in that way. Let me talk about income distribution and why we get biased in the direction of freedom when we're Austrian economists even though the one has nothing to do with the other. Now, the way the mainstream people see utility, the way they see utility is psychologically, and they look at it in terms of cardinal utility where you can actually count utils. So what they'll have is some sort of diagram where you have utils here, and you have maybe beer here. And what they say is the first beer you enjoy it, but only so much. Can you all see that in the back? The second beer, now you're getting warmed up, and the first one went down too quickly. You hardly appreciate it, but the second one, wow, you're really into it now. So the second beer is a little bit better, and the third one is even better. And then after the uh, fourth and fifth and sixth, and maybe it's even negative after a while if you get drunk. <laughs> Namely, what you have is some sort of curve like that. Namely, it's an empirical thing, and it's measuring utils. Well, I've got news for you people. There ain't no such thing as utils. We have measurements for speed, height, weight, acceleration. But we don't have units of happiness. You can't say that this pen is worth three units of happiness, and this cough drop is worth one unit of happiness, and therefore this one is three times as happiness creating as this is. <laughs> It's crazy, but yet to put utils on an axis is to, is to say that. And this is nonsense on stilts. There, there is no such thing as cardinal utility, cardinal as in counting. There is only ordinal utility. Ordinal utility is that if, um, if I trade uh, Richard for his tie against this pen, uh, it means that I value Richard's tie more than this pen, and it means that he values this pen more than my tie. Ordinal, rank ordering. Ordinal comes from ordering. We can order things, rank them. I rank this higher, he ranks that higher. We trade, we both benefit to the tune of the difference in our views between the thing we're getting and the thing we're giving up. In the ex ante sense of anticipations, later on in the ex post sense, we might regret it conceivably. But in the ex ante sense, necessarily, there's benefit from every trade. And since all the market is, is a bunch of trades, the market benefits everyone. The market is great. So we think in terms of ordinal utility or order. Now let's look at what these bad guys do with this diagram. What they say is that there's diminishing marginal utility. Okay, so what does diminishing marginal utility look like? Well, diminishing marginal utility means here are dollars, and here is utils. And you see, uh, with the beer thing, before you reach a point of diminishing marginal utility, whereas with Austrians, it's necessarily diminishing. For example, if you've got five bottles of water, and I'm a hold-up man, and I come and I say, give me one of the bottles. And the first bottle you drink, and the second bottle you wash yourself, and the third bottle you feed your cows, and the fourth bottle you wash your car. Well, which bottle of water are you going to give up? Obviously, the bottle of water that was doing the least important job for you. So necessarily, marginal utility is diminishing for the Austrian. So look at what these bad guys do. They say, okay, here's diminishing marginal utility. Here's a guy with 100,000. And what we'll do is we'll take away 1,000 from him. And now he'll have 99,000. And what we'll do is here we have a guy who has 7,000. And we'll give him that $1,000. And now he'll have 8,000. So he'll gain this much utility. And this guy, the rich guy, will only lose that much utility. Do you get it? Namely, if you take money from a rich guy 
and you give it to a poor guy. The rich guy has so much money that the last dollar he's um, lighting his cigarette on or something like that. <laughs> he's using it for frivolous purposes. Whereas the uh, first guy is you know, practically starving, so a dollar to him or a thousand dollars to him is very important. So you can increase welfare if you force the rich guy to give money to the poor guy. And you can see why the Austrians are bi uh, biased against, in favor of markets and against this stuff. And you can see why the Chicagoans are, and the mainstream economists are biased in favor of non-liberty. Namely, that they have a little tension or a little contradiction. On the one hand, they want to increase wealth. Which economist worthy of assault doesn't want to do that? On the other hand, they've got this coordinate utility theory. So this sort of biases you in, in, in that direction. Let me, I started at 7.30, so I'm now halfway through. So I have to get off Austrian economics. There's a lot more I could be said, uh, saying about it. Let me just list the other things that I think are important for Austrian economics. Uh, let, let me just do one more, transitivity. Transitivity is you prefer A to B, you prefer B to C, therefore you must prefer A to C. That's what transitivity is. Now, in a sense, if, if you say 8 is bigger than 7 and 7 is bigger than 6, therefore 8 is bigger than 6, this is true. Heck, you could even do it the other way around. You could say uh, 6 is bigger than 7, 6 is bigger than 7, 7 is bigger than 8, both are false, in which case it follows that 6 is bigger than 8. doesn't matter which way you go. But the mainstream people are rabid that transitivity uberalis. Transitivity is the... Rationality. Whereas for Austrians, what we say is, look, this occurred at time one. This occurred at time two. This occurs at time three. You can change your bloody mind. There's nothing illogical about changing your mind. The reason that they insist upon transitivity is because they love indifference curves. Don't ask. It's a perversion. It's, uh, I think Elliot Spitzer was into indifference curves. <laughs> I'm, ju I'm just kidding, just kidding. Don't want to be arrested or anything, but uh, they love indifference curves, and for indifference curves you need transitivity, and indifference curves are just another way of showing that uh, the government can do great things by taking money away from rich people and giving it to poor people. So these are sort of indications as to why economists of the mainstream are more inclined toward anti-libertarianism than are Austrians. It's not perfect. There might be some Austrians who aren't libertarians, and there are certainly many non-Austrians who are libertarians. But by and large, there is, this, there is this difference. Other important things in Austrian economics, let me just give you one more, and then I'll get on to libertarianism. And, and this is this uh, business of um, Keynesianism. Uh, see, the way the Keynesians see it, the economy is sort of like a car. You're driving along the car and there's a cliff and there, you can fall off in either direction. You can fall off into unemployment or you can fall off into inflation. And the government's got to steer the car because the, the laissez-faire economy keeps falling off into one or the other. And if you are falling into unemployment, then you have to increase something, government spending. Now here, the, the right-wing and the left-wing Keynesians diverge. The right-wing Keynesians say you have to pump more money in. The left-wing Keynesians say you have to pump more fiscal policy in, taxes and spending. On the other hand, if you're afraid of inflation, then the, the right-wing Keynesians, the Friedmanites, say you have to lower money supply. The other guys say you have to lower uh, fiscal policy. The Austrians don't buy this car is likely to fall off anywhere. They say the car is very, very stable. The reason we're always falling off into inflation or unemployment is because the government is creating a money supply, excess money supply. We don't have the gold standard. They increase the money supply. They lower interest rates. Lower interest rates means that they push, give incentives to entrepreneurs to engage in investments that they never would have invested in more in heavy industry like uh, iron and steel and cement. And when they can no longer keep doing this because of expectations, uh, they have to pull back and then we have a depression. And the depression is the cleansing of the errors of the Fed and the government. 
So it's a very different sort of a thing. I remember once Arthur Burns, who was the head of the Fed, and he was Murray Rothbard's advisor at Columbia, uh, was once asked, well, suppose you have unemployment and inflation at the same time. Then what would you do? And he said, oh, we'd have to resign. <laughs> well, <laughs> there is such a thing called stagflation. And then what are you supposed to do? It's, un it's unclear. Namely, uh, th this theory is bankrupt. OK, uh, other things, uh, part of Austrianism that I don't have time to go into are um, bailouts, which is sort of like taking money from the heavy, deep part of the pool and putting it in the shallow end of the pool and expecting the pool to change. I mean, you know, how are you going to bail out people if you take money from some people and give it to other people? Well, these people will spend it, but those people won't. So it doesn't work. Soci socialist calculation debate is very important. Market process, we're never at equilibrium. We're always moving around. What's true or not true at equilibrium is relatively unimportant. Rather, the market process, then there's this over-mathematicalization of economics, and then there's methodological individualism. There is no such thing as to society other than the individuals comprised, comprising it. If all the individuals in this room leave, there'll be nobody left, there'll be no group. Right now, there's a group, but it's just a shorthand way of saying individuals. Okay, this is a short version or a short introduction to what Austrian economics is all about. There's a lot more to be said, but you can't cover everything in a half hour. Let me now talk about libertarianism a little bit. And I've got some articles from my book, uh, Defending the Undefendable. For you, a special deal. <laughs> if you send me or give me this evening a check for 15 bucks made out to Walter Block, I will make sure that you get a, book, a copy of this wonderful, wonderful book. This is the greatest book since sliced bread. <laughs> Enough of the um, paid political announcement here. Back to libertarianism. Okay. The first point that I want to make is blackmail laws are illegitimate. We should allow blackmail. What is blackmail? Blackmail is, I've discovered that Richard takes a bath with a rubber ducky. <laughs> it's true. He'll deny it, but it's true. <laughs> and I threaten him. I say, look, if you don't give me a thousand bucks, or sexual services, but in this case that wouldn't work, <laughs> I will tell the world that you take a bath with a rubber ducky. That's blackmail. Threatening to tell a secret? Well, what am I threatening him with? I am threatening him with being a gossip. Isn't that what I'm threatening him with? And is being a gossip illegal? No, not yet at least. All gossiping is is free speech. Right? Now, the, you have to distinguish between blackmail and extortion. Because if I say, Richard, give me a thousand bucks or I'll kill your wife, now the threat is something that I have no right to do. See, I have a right to gossip about him but I have no right to kill his wife or to burn down fee or something like that. And if that's my threat, that's extortion and that should be illegal, but blackmail should not be. See, there's a paradox of blackmail. People have various theories as to why blackmail is illicit because blackmail is just the threat of illicit thing. It's the threat of something you have a right to do. So if you have a right to do it, how can it be a crime to actually do it? And my solution to the paradox is to reject the paradox. Namely, I say it's, we ought to legalize blackmail. Take another case, uh, libel. This is another chapter in my book. What I did when I told everyone that Richard takes a bath with a rubber ducky is I ruined his reputation because now he'll be unemployable. Everyone will laugh. Ha ha, Richard, you take baths with rubber duckies. We don't want to have anything to do with you. You're a vermin, whatever. Now, Richard has worked very hard. Boy, this'll, he'll never invite me to give a speech again. <laughs> now, Richard worked very hard for his reputation. And the truth of the matter is he doesn't take a 
bath with a rubber ducky, or at least not to my knowledge, I've never seen him. But, but the point is that if I say this, I've ruined his reputation. None of you will have anything to do with him. The demand curve for his services in economic parlance will shift to the left. People will pay him less, he'll have fewer opportunities. He worked hard for his reputation. You know, when you sell a business, sometimes what the big part of the business is is goodwill, not the physical plant. Well, goodwill is just another word for reputation, and if you start saying that the McDonald's sells rat poison in their soup or whatever, or in their burgers, you ruin their reputation. So shouldn't libel and slander, whether written or spoken, be illegal? Isn't it worse to steal someone's reputation than to steal their coat, and we're already on record as opposing people stealing other people's coats? Well, according to the radical libertarian view that I espouse, no. Because what do reputations consist of? Reputations consist of the thoughts of other people, not of yourself. My reputation consists not of what I think of myself, but what you all think of me. Richard's reputation consists not of what he thinks of himself, but what we all think of him. So, can I really own my reputation? No, because I can't own your thoughts, and, and that's what my reputation consists of. Nothing more and nothing less than your thoughts. So since I can't own your thoughts, they're yours. I can't own my reputation, paradoxically. Even though I work hard to build it up, and even though I can benefit from the building up of it, I still can't own it. So in a free society, libel and slander will not be a crime. Lest you think that reputations will be less safe in a free society than they are now, realize that we have different rules for public, what is it, public uh, figures than for private figures. Well, where does that come in to, to libertarianism? If you're a public figure, you have less or fewer or more rights than other people? That's lunacy. Right now, you know, there are ads in the papers or on the blogs for house wanted, roommates wanted, jobs wanted, dates wanted, whatever. Under a regime of free enterprise, there would be a new column and it would call libel. And it would consist of Richard takes a bath with Robert Ducky, uh, Joe's red tie shows that he's a commie, and, you know, uh, everyone would be uh, shooting forth all sorts of nasty things to everyone else, and no longer would the mere allegation suffice to ruin your reputation. Namely, reputations would be safer, paradoxically, if we didn't protect them by law. Because now, right now, if I say, you know, Richard, people say, well, with the smoke, this fire, maybe it doesn't take a bath with a rubber ducky, maybe it's a plastic ducky, but it doesn't matter, <laughs> he's still a bum, you know. So, <laughs> so things would be a lot better off under a regime of full free enterprise. Let's take the next one, incitement. Should incitement be a crime? So I say to you, go, burn, rape, loot, kill. And you idiots go out and do it. <laughs> now, you should be, you're criminals for doing that. But what about me, innocent little old me? All I did was incite you. Should I be guilty of a crime of incitement? No, not according to the <laughs> radical libertarian view of law. I should not be because there's such a thing as free will. And if you morons are going to go out and do that, it's your own bloody fault. Now, if I say, go burn, rape, loot, get the Jews, and I give you a map of where they're hiding, and I give you some guns, then I'm doing a lot more than inciting. Now I'm aiding and abetting, and now I should be a, considered a criminal, but not for merely inciting and, and having an arm's length distance with you. In other words, if I aid and abet, and I'm part of the criminal gang that kills innocent people, oh yes. Look, the getaway driver doesn't pull the trigger, but he's guilty of something. The guy, the mastermind who plans the crime, he doesn't pull a trigger either, but he's guilty. So an aider and an abetter and a cooperator and a getaway driver and a planner, they're criminals, but not an insider. Look, um, Rushdie wrote this book, which was considered incitement. He said things that certain people didn't like. Well, in my view, he's innocent. He didn't, I mean, Look, every time they show a movie where gangs fight and young men go and watch it, after the movie, they, the, the incidence of crime is higher. So what are we going to do? Put the movie people in jail? 
Yet that would be the implication of laws against incitement. Okay, let me try another one. Hostile takeovers. Now, the way I see things, the market consists of voluntary trade. There's no hostility. There can never be any hostility because there's always agreement. I want to buy your shoes. I'll give you 100 bucks. I'll give you 500 bucks. If you give me your shoes for 500 bucks, can I be said to hostily have taken over your shoes? No. There was no hostility. So whence comes hostile takeovers? Where they come from is the following example. There's this hotel. The hotel is being run into the ground by bad management. The hotel could be worth 10 million if it was run right. Right now it's worth 1 million because it's being run poorly. So what I do is I buy the hotel at a price that reflects the 1 million value. And I kick out all the managers and I put in new managers. Did, the, did I, when I bought this hotel, did I buy it hostily from the owners of the hotel? No, they were glad to get rid of the hotel, otherwise they wouldn't have um, agreed to the deal. But the managers don't much like it. To them it's hostile, but they're not the owners. You see the point? So of course you can have hostility in that way, but they're not part of the market. Look, you can do harm to all sorts of people in all sorts of ways that don't count among libertarians. For example, um, I'll pick on Richard again. Richard has a lovely wife and I want to date her. Let's say they're not married so we don't get in that problem. And somehow I'm so handsome and you know, lovely and wonderful that I woo her away from him. Have I hurt him? Well, in some sense, but he doesn't own her. Or let's say I set up a, 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 an organization right across the street. Fee double or something. <laughs> Super fee. <laughs> sort of like in supersizing. And let's suppose that I wean away all of you customers of fee. Have I hurt him in some sense? Yes, in some sense I've hurt him. But I have a right to. It's just called competition. You can't put people in jail for the crime of competing. We now have this thing called vultures. Vultures of people who buy up real estate at low prices. Right? I mean, we're having a uh, fall in the real estate market, so there are prices falling, and now I'm a vulture and I go buy it up. That's silly. I mean, it was a voluntary trade. Yes, the, the house used to be worth a million, and now it's worth 100000 and I'm paying 100000 and the guy sells it to me, and he sort of wishes he had a million for it, but he's willing to sell it to me. He put his uh, signature on the dotted line. So why do I deserve to be called a vulture? Let me try one last one because I'm almost at the end of the time. Let me talk about a very interesting case called, I'm not going near there. <laughs> it's a case called Sturgis versus Bridgman. It was a very famous law case. And I forget who was Sturgis and who was Bridgman, it doesn't matter. What happened was there were two contiguous houses and this guy was a pharmacist and this person was a doctor and originally what happened was that the doctor had his office over here and the pharmacist had his grinding machinery here and the machinery was grinding chemicals to make uh, pharmaceuticals what have you and it made noise and I illustrate the noise by these little dashes. Can everyone see that? Okay. And then what happened is that the 20 years later, the doctor moved his office here. And he sued the pharmacist for noise pollution. So it's a question of, well, who is in the right? Now the way the Chicagoans answer this one this is a guy named Ronald Coase, who is a Nobel Prize winner. Is he says, well, which is more, you see, the doctor needs quiet because he has a stethoscope and if there's a grinding machine he can't listen to the patient's hearts or lungs or whatever. He was fine over here, he's not so fine here. 
So the way Coase would answer this question is, will GDP be higher if the pharmacist has it, or will GDP be higher if the doctor has it? Namely, what we want to do as good economists is maximize wealth. Notice the conflation of the normative and positive here. And we're going to give it to the person, I forget who, who it was. That doesn't matter. What I'm trying to say is that this is not the libertarian way of deciding such questions. Rather, the libertarian way is based on homesteading. Who was there first? And the way the libertarian answers it, it says, well, B was there first with the noise. So you give it to B, no matter the value. See, the problem with this is suppose that, see, relative prices are continually changing. The prices of pharmaceuticals and the prices of doctor services are continually changing. So one time you award it to the doctor, because doctor prices are higher, and the next week or the next month you give it to this guy. There's no rhyme or reason to the law. Whereas it's a matter of principle, you give it to the proper owner, and the proper owner is the first person who, who used it. Now we can come up with all sorts of reductios ad absurdum of the coast position. Suppose, Joe, give me your wallet. <laughs> give me, uh, I'll take a check. <laughs> this, this here is a wallet. <laughs> he doesn't trust me. <laughs> now, the question is, who, own, who is the proper owner of Joe's wallet? It's got his wife's picture in it. It's got his mistress's picture in it. <laughs> kidding, I'm just kidding. Uh, it's got uh, his business card in it. <clears throat> the way the libertarian will answer that is historically, not hysterically, historically. Namely, where did it come from? And it'll give it to Joe. Whereas the way the Kosian Chicagoan type will answer this question is, who can make best use of that wallet in the future? Namely, it's future-oriented. See, what they're asking there is, if you give it to the doctor or the pharmacist, who will make better use of it to enhance the GDP better? They're not looking at the past, they're looking at the future. Uh, what's his name, who's always urging us to go forward and not backward? What's his name, Barack Obama? With hope. With hope. No, he wants to go forward, not backward. Well, the Chicagoans would be Barack Obamians, if you want. They look forward. We Austro libertarians, or mainly libertarians here, don't look forward, we look backward. We say, where did you get the wallet from? We don't say, what will you use it for? Now look, he's a bum. All he's going to do with the money is get drunk, right? Whereas I will create wonderful uh, whatevers, <laughs> sonatas, poems, who knows? I'm just capable. Uh, if I have the wallet, the GDP will be much higher than if he has the wallet. So therefore, I should get the wallet. Namely, it's a complete abnegation of property rights. Look, at least the commies had a, pro a system of property rights. The bourgeoisie were bad, the proletariat were good, the proletariat should take the property of the bourgeoisie. It's not a great property rights system, but it's a property rights system. The Chicagoans had no property rights system. One day the court will give it to me, the next day the court will give it to him. Take rape. Now, the problem with rape is that it's, a, it's an invasion of property rights. But, I've been at sea for six months, I'm desperate. Uh, this woman is a woman of loose morals anyway. I value the intercourse at 5,000. It only costs her 1,000. Notice the, uh, the uh, what do you call it, uh, cardinal utility in here. How they can decide such things. They just decided uh, right off the top of their heads. Therefore, GDP will be higher if I'm allowed a raper than if I'm not. So rape is justified. You can justify anything if you're a crazy Chicagoan non-libertarian. It's now an hour. I've been at it, so thanks for your attention.